evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Isaiah Brighton. I am a graduating senior of Jackson State University Science Department. Uh, thank you all for coming out this evening. This evening we are honoring Judge Carlton Reeves. Uh, he is the United States District uh, Judge of the Southern District of Mississippi. Um, we are going to have our panelists here, uh, starting from my immediate left. We have uh, Jeremy Anderson. Uh, next to him, Ron Berry, Jordan Carter, Brianna Davis, Natalie Nicholson, Nicholson and Kesey Reeves. Um, they will be answering, they will be asking uh, the judge some questions this evening. We're going to be following uh, our brochure. Uh, yeah, we'll right here. Um, we're going to start very promptly. We're going to follow to the left. Everybody has a rough pronouncing my name. Yeah, I understand it. Uh, I couldn't miss this session uh, this evening, spe specifically because we have our own students performing here. Uh, these are future leaders of the United States, lawyers, and politicians, probably. And of course, we have our judge, Carlton Reeves. I have a special relationship with him because. I was his teacher a long time ago. <laughs> he was one of the brightest. He was among the honor students that I taught. He's the one on one and one on two. And uh, he always had A's. And when he graduated, uh, I was in North Carolina, in Charlotte. And he, became, he came to Charlotte as an intern, I think. And we went to lunch that time. We had the best of time. Uh, I want to welcome everyone, uh, the administrators, the faculty, the students, the staff, and all friends of Jackson State University, particularly friends of the College of Liberal Arts, in which the uh, uh, Hammer Institute is housed. We're very proud of it. We want you to enjoy the session tonight, and I'm really interested in knowing how these students are going to perform tonight. But before I step down from the podium, the side of the podium, I want to commend Dr. Monica Cooper. Is she here? <laughs> <laughs> She's in the back. Oh, here you are. <laughs> <laughs> because we're here. This is a wonderful occasion for our students to perform well. And uh, I'm so glad that you had the idea of having this session tonight. Important. It's educational, it's historic. So thank you for coming, and hopefully you will enjoy the activities that will go on in a few seconds. Thank you.
compiles of what was going on uh, in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, and the civil rights era. Um, you're going to, I'm sure that some of these discussions are going to come out, but if they don't, just know that COFO was at the center of a lot of these movements that we're talking about today, because uh, COFO helped to change the fabric of America the way we see it today. So again, we want to welcome you, and if there's anything that you need to let us know, make sure you sign the roles so we can keep in touch with you. And thank you, Dr. Cooper, uh, for, for allowing this event to be in this particular space. And for for wanting to uh, host this event in this space. Thank you so much.
who left her and five sisters and their mother all too soon when he was assassinated by his brethren in February of 1965. The students, having visited Mr. Bad, Mr. Bass and Rennie Edwards Edwards, the daughter of Mississippi's slain son, Edgar Edwards, are more empowered and even more inspired to return to Alabama, this time to the Edwards Pettus Bridge, a structure forever memorialized by the brutality of Bloody Sunday, March 7, 1965. But the challenge for our students began even before they met Ms. Shabazz and Ms. Evers. It was suggested, and I would think rather imperatively, when they returned to the classroom in January, that they visit the cinemas to see Ava DuVernay's Hollywood production of Selma in anticipation of our travel in March. We dissected the movie, uh, the reviews, the comments, the criticisms, we even revisited the television movie, Selma, Lord Selma, in our classroom discussions and in, in our essays so that we could fully appreciate all the sacrifices that were made, the lives that were lost, all for the right to vote. So it was only befitting that the completion of the sojourn of the humanities culminate in an evening from the Mississippian who has done each of us proud. In February, when I shared with Eleanor Cliff, the political reporter and pundit with the Daily Beast that there's nothing Judge Reeves could say to any audience that would be construed as offensive because he speaks from the heart and challenges us. I meant that. I was at a luncheon at the Mississippi chapter of the Federalist Society a few years ago when then Attorney Reeves was the keynote speaker. I believe Judge Reeves at that time was the president of our Magnolia Bar Association. I cannot recall the hot topic or the controversial issue that Judge Reeves addressed, but as he spoke, it was as though John the Baptist was speaking. And I thought to myself, he's scolding these folks, and he, they're all nodding and agreeing. I couldn't believe how mesmerized the members of the Federalist Society were as Judge Reeves took them to the woodshed. That was the scene that I recall when I spoke with Ms. Cliff about Carlton Reeves. Now, I imagine that article in the Daily Beast was read lot widely across the country, but when Gene Frazier, the Vice President of Institutional Advancement here at JSU, read it, she gave it life, and for that, I owe her thanks. And we are here tonight as a testament to the good works of Judge Reeves. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I am extremely excited and delighted to present to you Yazoo City's own. That Yazoo City thing is a running joke uh, between Rodney and me because I always tell people I'm from Yazoo City. That's what I'm from. Thank you for inviting me this evening. I'm going to be brief tonight it's about these students and the things that on their minds, but I did want to share a couple of points with you. Uh, Ms. Cooper mentioned the Eleanor Cliff piece from the Daily Beast. Eleanor Cliff was tuned to the Daily Beast before I say this. I want to acknowledge Dr. Azabella. That was my history professor. My first year history professor at Jackson State, Western City. 101, 102. There's something special about HBCUs, and I told some other people that uh, a few weeks ago. That's why I had the opportunity to engage in real deep conversation and thought and learning about myself. Yes, I'm from Yazoo City, but I didn't know I was from Yazoo City. I learned that when I came to Jackson State. I learned more about myself, more about my town, than I had ever known after I had come to Jackson State. And I learned more about the world. There was this opportunity opened up for us uh, first year for the freshman students to participate in a mock UN uh, uh, thing up at Mississippi State. And Dr. Azevedo got a team of us students to go up there to Mississippi State and to defend, um, I think one of the subjects was there was somebody going over at Eritrea, Eritrea, 
uh, and to talk and discuss about that particular issue. That opened my mind to, to the world. Being there and wondering why these African guys in Mississippi State are taking that other position, the position that they were assigned to take. I couldn't understand that at first. But that's part of the growing and the learning process. There's something special about HBCU. There's something special about it. And I tell folk that all the time. Jackson State, yes, I'm from here as you said, but I learned more about myself at Jackson State, and I took that with me wherever I went. So, but uh, the, the point that I, the other point that I want to uh, share with you is that this is about these students. Tonight's celebration, and I, and I, and I you know, I, you know, flattered about the uh, things that have been said and done, and uh, I, I saw the album of the piece, and it was very nice, and it was on the heels of the code switch piece that was in NPR. NPR carried uh, the uh, a copy of, of the speech uh, that I gave to the, the remarks that I made at the sentencing of the uh, uh, young men who were involved in the hate crimes murder here. And that code switch piece, when it was posted, I later learned uh, was one of the most read pieces uh, that had come across their site. I understand from reading later on that it got over a million hits. And I've received messages from all across the country and even the world about those comments. And so uh, the person who's affiliated with NPR, Kenya Downs, uh, called because she wanted to do a follow-up. And her follow-up, uh, uh, her follow-up, she wanted to do a follow-up. She had heard a story and trying to do a follow-up piece. She had heard the story of, uh, she, she wanted to confirm something. She said, I want to confirm this story that I've heard. I heard that your mother used to clean up a law office. And I said, oh, Ms. Downs, I'm so glad you called me. I am so thrilled you called me because that is not true. That story has taken a life of its own. At my investiture, it was misstated that my mother had actually cleaned the law office. In fact, it was me. My mother was a maid at the Yazoo Hotel. She did not do offices. That was me. And it was only me because the woman who used to do the uh, uh, who used in her second or third job. She was one of the first black registered nurses. Had it been Carl Mitchell calls it. <coughs> and in the evenings, she cleaned up law offices. And she cleaned up the law office of Henry Ball and he said, the law office of Judge Ball practice. And so she was out of town one week, and she asked my, my great uncle, who was like my grandmother, she said, well, uh, while I'm out of town this week, get one of your boys, if you will, to clean the office. And I gladly accepted it. You know, I wanted to be in the office. I wanted to see what I've never been in one. So yeah, I wanted to be in So I was the one who cleaned the office. So I told Ms. Downs, I said, thank you for letting me, allowing me to get that record straight. Well, uh, as we continue to talk, and then later on, I saw the piece that Ms. Downs uh, actually posted. This is the piece with the follow-up piece to the code switch piece, which carried the speech as a follow-up to it, that talked about the this thing, the code switch piece, got a million hits. And the follow-up uh, thing mentioned that, well, it did mention that I was the one who cleaned it up, cleaned up the office, but she also mentioned a couple other things. Uh, she said, uh, uh, Judge Reeves went up to the University of Virginia, and he graduated uh, among the top of his class. That was a shock to me. <laughs> that was a shock to me. 
because I know what grades I had, and I know that Virginia, they had a BB. I know that. I know that. And I know that I was around the average. So if I'm around the average, obviously, there's people above me and below me, I, I suspect. So that was not all, you know, that was not all that. Uh, the other part that she made, she said, and when he graduated, the office came flow. I don't remember any office in the floor. I remember interviewing with law firms here in Jackson, Mississippi, and not getting a summer job. Not getting hired. I remember applying for federal clerkships and other clerkships and not getting hired. I applied for three clerkships. I got one. And that was Justice Ruben Adams of the Mississippi Supreme Court. The first African-American judge, justice on the Mississippi Supreme Court. And you talk about the Voting Rights Act and things of that nature. He was, uh, I guess, nominated, in, I guess he was appointed in 1985, but he had to run in 1986 to, to, to keep the rest of the years on his term. The person who he ran against, who ran against him because he's the incumbent, was Richard Barrett. Richard Barrett's claim to fame was that he was a racist. No doubt about it. White citizen, whatever, whatever his association was. He was an avowed person. That was the only thing, that was his claim to fame, and that's what he wrote. That's what he wrote in. And in Mississippi in 1986, the Supreme Court Justice, who had been appointed by, I guess at that time, Governor Bill Lane, I think, who was running to complete the full term, some Mississippians decided to give 25% of their vote to Richard Beck. And his only question was, I'm not black and he is. And I'm a racist and he's not. You talk about the voting rights act. Mississippi has come a very long way. You see the uh, things here on the wall, you see them out there. You, you, you see about 95% of the people not being registered at one point in time. I hope everybody in this room is indeed registered, and every time the poll house opens, you're there to vote. Your vote has so much power, so much meaning. It decides your fate every day. When we were in school, we were arguing about equity funding, and Jackson State, and vis-a-vis and, and -vis what was going on at Ole Miss and what was going on anywhere else. Since that time, we've had the heirs litigation and all that. But that vote determines a whole lot, determines everything about you. And every time there's been a movement to empower people, Mississippi has resisted. Even in 1965, the first thing Mississippi in 1966 was to change the rules of engagement and they did not see clear, pre clearance for it, which is what was required by the new Voting Rights Act of 1965 and Mississippi had to be held into court and sued. And it was like that in 1970 with trying to get congressional districts to try to get the districts where, where Persons could choose the person of their choice, which ultimately ended up in the creation of the second congressional district. It also manifested itself on our uh, 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 state legislative districts and everything else. Right before I started school here, well, no, I was in school here in Jackson, I guess. Jackson was under the condition of war. You had three people, three white males, who represented the city of Jackson. You did not have the city council form of government. Henry Curtis brought that lawsuit. And every time there's been manifest change, it's been through litigation. It's been through litigation. The judge who took senior status, and 
who I was nominated to replace Judge William Mark. Many don't know, many don't appreciate, but one of his most famous cases in my view, one of the, one of the most, he's had a few, but one of the most significant in my view was his case where he said that the Voting Rights Act applies to judicial elections. <coughs> judicial elections, not just executive elections and his president's fans and all that, not just legislative seats. All of them. The Voting Rights Act itself applies to judicial, to the judiciary. We in Mississippi elect our judiciary. But at one time, there were no blacks in the judiciary. We had two. You had Reuben Anderson and Fred Banks. Reuben Anderson was on the Mississippi Supreme Court, and Fred Banks had been nominated and, 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 and appointed to assume the position Judge Anderson held on the circuit court bench here in Hines County. That was it for the state of Mississippi. That was it. So regardless of the number of chancery court judges, regardless of the number of circuit court judges that you had, regardless of the eight other members of the Supreme Court, that was it. But he said that the Voting Rights Act applies to judicial, judicial elections. And that ended up meaning that blacks could run, that blacks could be elected from districts where people could vote for the person of their choice. That election of those black judges in 1989, that's when the first, that's when the first, that was the first wave, 1989, Denise Sweet Owens, Isidore Patrick, Pat Wise, and, uh, and a few others. That opened the door. And then later on, as more redistricting came about, you had the election of more black judges. So what did the election of black judges do? Those same law firms that had not, had turned me down for whatever reason. It was probably because I did not graduate at the top of my class. <laughs> Maybe that was the reason. Maybe it was the reason because I didn't go to old this Mr. Conference. Whatever the reason was. Maybe. What's the model about it? <laughs> then the doors of those law firms opened. Then those opportunities came from black lawyers. Many more black lawyers and many more black lawyers. The voting rights. It's a thing that keeps on giving. We all have benefited from the blood of of, of Mary Evans, as you said, Vernon Knight, we all, their blood runs in every black elected official, every black appointed official. That Voting Rights Act has power, it has meaning. As uh, I was looking through a book, uh, Gordon Martin came here in 1962, he was at DLJ. And obviously, that was before the Voting Rights Act. And he came to Mississippi as a DOJ attorney. And he writes that uh, when he came, uh, this is pre-voting rights, this is, uh, there had been laws on the books to enforce and enfranchise black citizens. And they, the DOJ, brought the first lawsuit against a circuit clerk because Theron Lynn down in Hattiesburg had refused to, had refused to register black people, which was against the law. So they came down here and prosecuted Theron Lynn. Theron Lynn was prosecuted, convicted, and through that, the, the irony of it all, the whole irony, is that the judge who presided over the case was uh, uh, Judge Harold Cox, who was not a friend of the civil rights movement at all. 
The judge who replaced Harold Cox is Judge William Barber. The judge who replaced Judge William Barber is standing before you today. The voting rights act. The power that vote. So if you are not registered, or if you decide that you don't want to vote in every election, think about those people who sacrificed so much uh, before you. So much, those folks who sacrificed so much so that you could be where you are here today. So as I just read, you know, we can go on and on and on. Just remember this. A lot of change that has come in Mississippi was not because the state cooperated. It was because talented lawyers, committed lawyers, decided to put words in the meaning of the Constitution and of certain legislation, i.e. the Voting Rights Act. And Mississippi, unfortunately, resisted just about at every turn. But it took a committed group of people doing their own thing, doing what they could do, doing what they were tasked to do, doing what they accepted to do, meeting the challenge, whatever challenge that was. They did, and they brought Mississippi into the 21st century. You think the Voting Rights Act does not mean anything? It does. I'll just give you a couple of examples. I'm an Article III judge appointed for life by a president who thought that it, by a president who received a recommendation, the nomination through my senators, but the recommendation from Congressman Benny Thompson, who came out of the second congressional district, the one that was created in the early 80s, the one that represented, allowed the citizens to vote for a person of their choice. And I was looking back at some stats and looking back at some things, and I noticed that when President Reagan was in office, for example, he appointed the most federal judges of anybody, 376, 83 to the Court of Appeal, and, and as of 2011, because these stats are a little off, 60 of those 83 were still served. How many of those of the 83, let's guess and see how many were African American on the Court of Appeals? One. 290 district judges. 2011, 170 of those 290 were still served. Of that 290, six African-American. Now, President Obama flipped the script generations down the road, record number of women serving, gays and lesbian appointed, record number of black folk appointed, record number of Hispanic appointed, record number of Eastern Indian Asians upon Asian Pacific upon Because there's something about diversity. I, I presume some people value it more than others, I guess. But the judiciary ought to look like the citizens they represent. <coughs> and so you see that. But all of that, I do believe, is tied to the right to vote. Because the only way that Carlton Reeves would have been nominated in 2010 was if he 
people have gotten out and voted in 2008 and elected the president, and they elected. And I understand that. So your little vote here makes an immeasurable difference in the lives of so many and in your life. And so always take that vote seriously. Every one of them, even if you are on the wrong side. And you think you're on the right side. That's fine. Just participate. And I'm so thrilled that the students have gone on to South Birmingham and gone on this tour and have done their research and looked at things. And I'm so glad that they've done that. And I hope that you all here commit yourselves to learning about our history here in Mississippi and learning to make sure that history never repeats itself. You can take away Section 5 of the Voting Rights and it's been taken, you know, the light of the teeth of it have been pulled out. So all you do is be instrumental in making sure that the other provisions work like they should. And that, you know, there's legislation right now to reenact or, or to redo. And the way you do that is you put pressure on the people who have the right to redo it. And those people are your elected representatives. So, Again, it goes back to that vote. It goes back to that vote. Thank you so much. Just, I got all that out of the way. <laughs> and I said this is night by the students, and it is. And I understand one young person is going to John Marshall Law School. I met this Mr. Bridey here, who's been accepted to the University of Oklahoma Law School. That's a great thing. Jackson State has a long legacy of sending lawyers to the best schools in the country. And I don't want y'all to ever think that you can't do it here at Jackson State. Harvard, Yale, Tulane, Hastings, Georgetown, Virginia, Northwestern, Vanderbilt, Texas, Northwestern, and, and Chicago. I've never said that already. We sent all those places. Yale. We sent them all to those places from right here at Jackson State. And trust me, you don't have to graduate in the top of your class. <laughs> Because 
You are formed and transformed by your experiences. And you carry those experiences with you through life. One of the points that I made in my investiture, which I chose to have right here at Jackson State four years ago, uh, for you non-lawyers, that's like an inauguration for the judges. I wanted to make sure that people came to this campus to see what Jackson State was, to see what we were doing here, the judges and everybody else. We had a great time. But one of the points in my uh, comments that I made in my investiture was uh, a couple of months before, the former chief judge of the Fifth Circuit, Charles Clark, uh, had died. And there was this nice piece that one of the other judges on the Fifth Circuit <coughs> had written about him. And I learned a lot about Charles Clark. Charles Clark was about the same age as my great aunt, that woman who I was dating, like my grandmother. But he, he had recently died, I think, in February of 2011. And as I was sitting down thinking about what I needed to say on that day, I thought about what I read about Charles Clark. And Judge Shalk had written about Charles Clark. Charles Clark's grandfather, I believe, was maybe one of the first governors of the state of Mississippi. His father was a lawyer. Uh, you know, Mississippi was 1817 or so. Uh, his father was a lawyer, maybe it was his great grandfather, somebody. Uh, uh, was like one of the first governors. But he had lawyers in his family. And one of the lines in my comments was Charles Clark was about the same age as my aunt at the time. She was born in 26. Uh, so, that, so she was about uh, 85 or so, I guess, at the time. Uh, and Charles Clark could look back more than 100 years and see lawyers. He was a judge. He had been a judge. He had been two judges. He could look back 100 years and see lawyers. When my 85-year-old grandmother could only look forward to that day and to see the first judge who happened to be the first lawyer in the entire family. And with that notion of lawyer privileges, rights, and all that stuff comes, power comes with being a lawyer. It does. Privilege, power, and all that. But that privilege and the power and all had been denied black folk in Mississippi until about the 1950s and 60s. In 1967, when Judge Anderson became a lawyer, he was like one of the only ones. And at the time of my investiture, he was the second oldest black lawyer in the state. The only one who had been admitted any longer than him was Mr. Chuck, Eddie Chuck, because the others could die. So you got Reuben Anderson and Fred Banks who became lawyers of, of within weeks of each other. And the only reason Justice Anderson held the only reason he was first is because he didn't have to take the bar. He didn't have to take the bar because he was with uh, Ole Miss. Fred Banks had to wait sit for the bar to get his results. I, and I know you got to wait out the water. <laughs> but that's the point of the matter. No black lawyers. 1967. Probably in 1989 when I, when I became, when I started practicing, I think there were less than 200 black lawyers in the state of Mississippi. How many second generation black lawyers are there? Probably less than 30 or 40. And you can probably find 30 or 40 fifth generation white lawyers. So you cannot disassociate yourself from your history. And when people start talking about things have changed, let's move on, well, let's look at the circumstances where people are now because of not having that opportunity to grow. <clears throat> Being denied that right to go to a school that's fully funded, where, where, where your tax dollars went and made sure that there was transportation 
so that the white kids could go to school every day by bus when you had to walk six or eight miles. You cannot disassociate yourself from the history, from the current stagnation, if you will, from the current position that people are in. You just cannot do it. And history has a fundamental role in where we are today and where we will be tomorrow. Now, I wouldn't expect that people, my daughters and my folk, I wouldn't expect her to have the same disadvantages that I have. But she's going to have some. But of course, again, you cannot disassociate. That's why knowing your history, and I encourage students to read, write, read everything, read anything, read, and learn that history because it just, I'm telling you, it just opened my mind, it just opened me. I learned so much about me. And yes, the city, when I came to Jackson State. One of my professors, Charles Holmes, for example, sitting up in his political science class, his pre-law class, he said, Reeves, have you ever read the book Yazoo? And I said, yeah, I read Yazoo, it's Legends and Legacies by Harriet DeSalle and Joanne Pritchard. That ain't the Yazoo I'm talking about. That old fond Yazoo by Harriet Kuykendall now, Harriet DeSalle and Joanne Pritchard, that fond, big old, nice little coffee table book is real great. It is. Tells about the witch of Yazoo City. But he was talking about Yazoo, the integration of the Southern Town by Willie Morris. And he, he shared that book with me. He gave it to me. He said, I want you to read it. And I learned so much, again, about myself. I learned so much because Willie Morris named names, told stories of people who I knew, who had grown up with, and now, and, and then, just a different sort of life on things. He talked about Mr. Patton, who owned one of the local stores. This is a guy, I'm not sure what his native country was, but Patton. The day after Martin Luther King was assassinated, Mr. Patton when he got a life membership in the NWT. I didn't know that until I got that. Again, you cannot disassociate your history from your present and your future. Take history seriously. Next question. I'm sorry. I, I, I won't be as long. <laughs> I might be as bad. <laughs> hello, everybody, and hello, Judge Reeves. I'd just like to give some background information and share with you all that on June 21st of 1964 in Philadelphia, Mississippi, three young men were murdered by the name of James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. These young men were arrested and taken into custody and released into the hands of the Ku Klux Klan and beaten and murdered. It took three years for the FBI to intervene and arrest 18 men. None of these 18 men were tried for the charge of murder. However, three of them were charged with manslaughter and sentenced to three to 10 years, which none of them served more than six. My question to you is, how do you feel that, how do you feel the relevance of these murders and these, of these three young men impacted the Voting Rights Act? And how do you propose that we um, motivate Mississippians to get out and vote, knowing that the impact of your votes do impact your lives every day? I think, I think part of our responsibility is making sure people appreciate civics education. We've moved so far beyond making sure people are good citizens. We're interested in the science and the math, the STEM sort of thing. And we've sort of taken out this whole idea of civic responsibility. And civic responsibility includes voting, it includes participating, it includes all those things. It includes you know, working on elections. It includes, you know, standing up and shouting about it. It includes serving on juries. Civic responsibility includes serving on juries, making sure your voice is represented there in the jury room. And don't be part of those who are on the outside saying that the brother can't get a fair trial. Because
because you have decided to raise your hand and ask to be excused. That's what civic responsibility is. Because I see so many times where people decide, I can't serve, I can't do it. This, I just don't feel comfortable. Somebody's life is at stake. And people need to bring in their differences to these jury rooms. Need to bring in their differences so that you can talk about them and so that, you know, we see things, people see things differently. People's experiences with law enforcement is different. Some people, because a police officer said it is so, it is so. But others, because of the experiences that you've had, the experiences of, of being accused wrongly of things, your experiences are different. Sometimes you're accused wrong, sometimes you're accused right. But your experiences are different. The deaths of the three civil rights workers, the death of Emmett Till, I mean, the heinous nature of these deaths. I mean, if you just sit back and you just think, you can't even think, you know, you know, uh, uh, what is it, raise it to the second power, or what, what is that little tool about? It's the square, not the square root, but the, the thing about the edge The edge bump. The edge bump. Maybe I need a stem for it, huh? The edge bump. It seemed to me that people were trying to one-up the other on how much violence and how much chaos and how much killing they can do. What can a little child who's in church on a Sunday morning do to you to make you want to blow up a church? A church in a place that you know nobody's prepared to do anything but pray to their Jesus and go to their Sunday school class. How dare you put a bomb in a church? So one person decides, that's not enough. Let's raise it up a notch. Next moment. Next, you know, let's do something. Let's do something even crazy. It was those things that challenged. Of course, we don't want to see that kind of stuff happen. Today. But if we read and we thought about, if we just decided that I'm going to go vote for Vernon Damon, who used to pay for the poll taxes of his friends and his neighbors. He saved up his own money to pay their poll taxes. If you don't vote for yourself, vote for those kind of people. Vote for your grandma who, 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 who didn't have the opportunity to vote for a black president. Or vote for somebody else than Shirley Chisholm, or Jesse Jackson, or Al Sharpton. And, and, and only voted with the hope that they would win, knowing that there was no chance. Go vote for, you know, if, if you don't vote for yourself, go vote for these other people. <coughs> vote for these people. Why the little girl, 16, uh, Street Baptist Church? And I think that those deaths sort of galvanized and brought focus to it just at that moment. I mean, Emmett Till was killed in the 1950s. Man. Civil rights workers killed in 1964. More deaths came after that. 65, 68, more deaths came. They continued to come. They came. They were never satisfied with enough. So the thing is, I think they galvanized people, but I think that people need to be reminded of the story. And those stories are indeed painful. I understand that. They are painful. They are painful. But history is painful. We've got the crusades and everything. People have been killing each other for years. And we'll continue to kill each other. So I think that that gathers out of some people. That I, is that, I'm going to try to be sure. <laughs> and less dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> More judicious, huh? <laughs> Hello, I'm Jordan Carter, political science major. Your answer was actually a great segue into my actual topic. Um, so basically, in September of 1963, four little girls, Maddie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Carol Denise McNair were killed in the bombing of 16th Street Baptist Church. 
Prior to the church bombing, numerous events such as the September 5th bombing of the Birmingham home of Arthur Shores, a local black activist, had impacted black lives in Birmingham. Yet many Alabama citizens still refuse to have active participation in the movement. Do you feel that the killing of four innocent young girls ignited Alabama citizens to begin actively participating in the movement? And if so, would it take a crime, as Martin Luther King Jr. put it, so vicious and tragic per perpetuating against humanity to ignite American citizens today to stand up against the attacks of our civil rights? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, I do think that that's gathering. But you have to understand, you have to understand the system people were living on. People were afraid. People were scared. Who wouldn't be? Who would not be scared? Knowing that your neighbor's house had got blown up. <clears throat> Knowing that these civil rights warriors who were spread thin, who would come into a community. There was only one Martin Luther King. There had a lot of people with him. But these people moved from town to town. They galvanized people in a locality, and they moved on. So I always say that the real heroes were those people who were from the communities and continued to work in the community who were subject to what's going to happen to you when they leave, when all the cameras leave. Those are the real people. Those are, those are other heroes, too. And we see them, and we tend to lose sight on them. Take you back to Yazzie City in the 1960s. There were a group of people who did join in the NAACP. And when we learned that they had joined the NAACP. The white citizen camp, again, to talk to you about people's experiences. There's a former governor who says that members of the white citizen camp were just upstanding good businessmen. Because that was his relationship with them. That's how he saw them. He saw them as good white businessmen because they went to church with them, because they lived next door to them, and because he grew up with their children, and because they were nice guys. We on the other side of the track, though, saw them different. These people went out and got a newspaper ad, posted every black person's name in the Kansas City who joined the NAACP, posted them downtown business everywhere, told the other white folk in the business, you cannot do business with these people. If they're working in your home, you got to fire them. People lost their jobs. Cardinal was a plumber, master plumber that lost all the businesses that he had. Just because he decided to stand up and say, I want to be a full citizen. So when you have situations where I do we need another death, I don't know. Why didn't people do it? Because there was a price to pay. And some people could not accept that price. The mother and father who had five children, they tried to make sure they get through school. Who wouldn't be scared? If you saw Miss Johnny's child get beat up by the police and nothing been done to it, you're going to tell your child to stay away from down there. Don't go to that rabbit. Don't do this. The art of intimidation, if you read, you will see just how pernicious and how bad it was for the local people every day. Every day. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Brianna Davis, speech communications major. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to actually travel to Birmingham, Alabama, and also this year, we traveled to Selma, Alabama. And I was introduced to the writer Malcolm X ballad or a bullet. And I encourage everyone to read this piece and dissect it because it's very prevalent to what's happening today with voting rights. And I wanted to know, let's talk about one of the things that struck out to me. 
uh, Malcolm X stated that black people need to take the fight beyond the civil rights and expand to human rights. Um, our battle today is a humane right. We can't help that our skin is brown. So how do we expand from the civil rights aspect that we've all been taught since 1950s to now when we need to expand it to the more humane <clears throat> rights? There's a bunch of rights that need to be tackled, I would imagine. Uh, some of which will be before me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but you do, you think about economic issues, you think about human rights, immigration, you think about making sure that everybody understands everybody is a person under our Constitution. No matter how they come to us, everybody is a person. We, we are a government of laws and all that kind of stuff. So, you expand it, you know, recognizing that the full breadth of the Constitution should cloak everybody. And I know we don't agree with everybody's values and everybody's opinion and all that, but when they are citizens of this country or they are affiliated with this country and they are full citizens or whatever, we have to give them the full clothes. What, what else do we do? We espouse this belief in being a country of laws, we make sure that others across the world understand that we are a country of laws and, and that it works. But America is a very young country. It's only 200 and something years old. That's it, that's young. You read about Greece and Rome and all that kind of stuff. And you have to understand that those countries had some of these battles a long ago. England had the Crusades. Spanish, English, and all that kind of stuff. So, so expand the belief in America. The belief in America. Uh, make sure that, that, that our belief in America, the values of America, are spread abroad and everywhere else would be my suggestion. And we're going to have to face this immigration issue. The United States is going to have to face it. And deal with it. I have to. How you do that? That's never up to that. Good evening. My name is Natalie Nicholson. I'm a history major with a minor in political science. And my question today is in August of 1963, we had the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And I want to know. What, what do you believe was the economic and political impact of said march? And how do you believe that impact compares to black, the black community today? I guess the impact of the march was is that it is shared with the country. The ills of what was going on across not necessarily the South, but across the country. Uh, the movement was going to shift eventually to an economic empowerment and anti-war and all that kind of stuff. Didn't make it to that point. And you know we've had other marches since then, commemorative marches and things of that sort. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what it's so impact was, uh, but I do know that there are still marches left to be done. And it does not have to be a march downtown. It can be any kind of quote unquote march. In other words, there is work to do for all of us in every phase of our being, be it education, politics, be it economic development, incubating businesses, there is still so much work to do. And you have to find your cause. You have to find your cause. Whatever cause that is, you have to find that cause. And you grow up and make sure that when your name is heard, it is associated with a cause. That's what I told you. We're getting that. And I'll go on there. Make sure when they hear your name. You know, when we hear Mega Evans, 
We're thinking about civil rights in public Mississippi. What's going to be your call? Because I want to say your name, and I want to immediately identify with a particular cause, with something of substance. So I guess I've sort of answered your question. Apologize, but I, I, I think that there's still work to do. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Judge Reeves. My name is Kisa Reeves, and I am a senior political science pre law student. Um, Judge Reeves, in Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, the comment on the wise and untimely were used in depicting the nonviolent demonstration against segregation. In regards of the term extreme and its definition, would you agree that Dr. King's act of extremism was the right cause, was for the right cause, excuse me, and was it appropriate in the attempt to challenge the status quo of blacks in the year of 1963? So how do I get up here and stand up and disagree with Dr. King? <laughs> Not to suggest that I am, uh, you know, very, very visionary guy who believed in this nonviolent thing. I mean, just think about it. Just think about it. How you can espouse loving your neighbor when your neighbor is busting you in the mouth. So what we're going to see now 
is this plan of action that we're going to see. People have been mobilized and things like that to go out and vote. So I want you all to take heed of that, what's going on in the news right now. I've been watching it this morning. They've actually been doing a pretty good job on that. But um, what we're going to do right now is actually open up for questions from the audience to give to Judge Reed. Um, Reed, I'm sorry. Please be mindful of time and um, make your questions clear and concise. So we have any questions. And I'll be master of time, too. <laughs> that, was, that was a cue to me. <laughs> uh, yes, I wanted to, um, well, first, it's, it's an honor to meet you, uh, Judge. Uh, the young sister who mentioned Malcolm X, I'm glad she did. Um, I was just going to be quiet and listen, but I can't be quiet with someone who mentions Malcolm X. I wanted to point out that you said, you suggested, Judge, that we, in your words, expand the belief in America. But of course, Malcolm believed in America. Malcolm rejected America, as did W.E.B. Du Bois. You also pointed to our ancestors who fought for the right to vote. But there are other ancestors who fought for other things, black radicals, who fought for other things, who rejected the idea of America. And so my question to you is, their, from their perspective, the system is rotten. It's so rotten that you can't fix it by putting black judges and other black officials on that system. You have to fundamentally change the system. Our in 2015, black people are still fighting to be called and treated as human beings. It suggests to me that perhaps they're right, it may be wrong. Well, in my courtroom, you're treated as human beings all the time. That's the difference. I do, I disagree with you. I, I, I do think that people who have the interest of what the words in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence say. If you have faith in those words, you bring those words to reality in the positions that you hold, in the schools that you attend, in the values that you speak and that you believe. I understand that, yeah, that some people will talk about go back to Africa or do other things. This is my country. This is mine. I'm an American. I am. Well, and we have to make sure that the ideals of America stand up and, and that, that those ideals represent you, that they belong to you, and you accept those ideals. You can expand upon them, but the basic notion of being a man, being a citizen, being who we who we are as Americans. You make sure that 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 I am an American means I am you. That that is me. And that no, whatever benefits any American deserve, I also deserve those benefits. And I deserve to, to decide how the government operates. I deserve to decide how the schools function. I deserve to decide how banks lend money to particular individuals, where people live, what they do, how things grow. I deserve to be a part of that. And so do you. You challenge the America to be the America that it ought to be and that was promised to each of us. <coughs> through the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, and all. Dred Scott challenged the America that existed at that time because he said, I'm from a slave state, but I'm in a free state, and now I'm a free man. Of course, the Supreme Court, through Judge Chief Justice Taney, told him, hell no, you are not a man, you are not a human. Would you have no rights to respect others, blah, 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 that deserve to be respected. But I think that those words that are written in that document belong to each one of us, each one of you, and you bring life to those particular words. I said I was going to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Sarah and I'm a graduate of Jackson State University. Um, you mentioned earlier about mm -hmm. civics education, social studies education, and I want to share a quote that I think is like my teaching philosophy because I'm actually a teacher now. 
uh, it's about John Dewey. Democracy has to be born anew in each generation, and education is its midwife, which essentially means that it's our responsibility to teach democratic and civic education. But as we know now, as it all has always been, there is an overemphasis on reading and STEM education in schools, mostly mathematics, not necessarily science, as it relates to the high school education. So, but we see that a lot of our students, first and foremost, are not passing the, because of their reading and mathematical the prowess, or they have other skills, but they're locked out of opportunity because now they don't have high school diplomas. So, how do we, uh, first and foremost, uh, increase uh, our funding? Because funding for education is being cut all the time. Uh, to and get these other arts education, civic education, social service education into uh, funding. And, uh, and then on top of that, how do we reverse this narrative that the only good people are people who can read and people who can do math? Like, so, that's my question. <laughs> well, well, one thing I tell all of all this is, is to read. <laughs> read. Read everything. And I just tell little kids, if you don't read anything but the back of the cereal box when you eat cereal in the morning, read. So much goes by us because we have not read. We don't know. We, reading is so far from those. So, so aside from that, though, I do think civics education has a place because politics control everything. You talking about arts education in the school? Guess what the school gets its money? Guess who decides how money is spent? Pe people at the Mississippi legislature. People who might not agree with that. So if they don't agree with that, you mount a campaign to get them out. Your local school board. <laughs> Everything is tied to that dollar and that vote. Your streets are not getting paid over there. And Every part of Jackson, then make sure that the city council understands that your streets are not getting paid. And the next time around, when we hear you say we're going to do something about it, no, you say you had your chance. So much is tied into that vote. Everything, we elect everything around here. We elect everything, every position. Again, I think it's all tied to that civics education, knowing what, knowing the three branches of government, knowing what roles each person has, knowing what the members of the board of supervisors do, knowing what your city council does, knowing the powers that the mayor has, the powers that you don't have, the knowing what a three-fourths vote is, and the culture and 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 filibuster again knowing how the political process works. Because as you know, you don't need a majority to always win. A significant minority, minority can, can, can stop a lot of things. We've seen it. Again, civics education. <coughs> no other questions? Patrice, uh, my name is Todd Allen. I'm a U.S. history teacher here in Jackson Public Schools. And um, when I attended in the early 70s a school that was put together by the White Citizens Council of the Council Schools. And so, so uh, in Mississippi here? Yeah. Right in Jackson. Okay, yeah. right in the Woodland Hills in that area? All of that, right okay. here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, on the seal of that school is <laughs> states' rights and racial integrity. <laughs> They were blatant in their uh, uh, white supremacy. Uh, then that, that same school changed over to be taken over by the church. And, uh, you know, the academy systems exist across Mississippi. And now, um, it seems as though the legislature is advocating charter schools. And uh, they're, they're, they seem to be, to me, it feels like a, a elephant, I mean, a camel's nose in the tent that if they are able to just change these academies. They change from openly racist to church schools to uh, now going to be government funded schools. Uh, 
I just wondered if you could speak to Charles. Who can't speak to Charles Stewart? Somebody, if that were to happen, somebody's going to find a lawsuit. And I don't want anybody to ever say, Judge Reeves already got his mind made up. He said so and so, so and so. So I got witnesses here, right? And Judge Reeves ran with that question. He said, no, I can't talk about that. Uh, no, but, but again, understanding history. We know private academies sprung up in Mississippi in 1954, 1955, and most of them in 1970. Because for you who don't know, in December of 1969, Alexander versus Holmes came down from the United States Supreme Court. And it said, Mississippi, desegregate now. Brown, all deliberate speed means now. Brown came down in 1954, and they told us, they gave the, 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 the cities, the counties, the states an opportunity with all deliberate speed to put in measures to sort of work it through. 1969, Mississippi was still segregated. 1969, so in December, that case came down. I think Fred Banks was one of the lawyers on, on the case, actually. That case came down. Students who went home for Christmas break of that year, 1969, <clears throat> when they came back to school in January of 1970, they were all at different schools. Administrations had changed. Most of the black principals and black people became assistant principals. That was one thing they had to deal with. But, but, but black kids now were in schools of white kids. And part of my biography is that in the fall of 1970, I was in the first class in Yazoo City that started out in the first grade with black students and white students. And it was 12 years later before we had an immigrant department, my senior year. Most of them didn't come. <laughs> but it was fully integrated, it was sponsored by the school. That was the first time. So, history. These academies, which were fully funded by our state then, they were getting the tax dollars, they were getting the, the books, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, we won't broach over to 2015 with the camel in the, in the, in the, in the, in the tent right now. All right. I got witnesses, right? I ain't saying anything about it. I got witnesses. OK, right. I got a reporter here who says, yeah, I got a witness. <laughs> OK, I'm going to assume that all the questions have been asked. Uh, thank you so much.
Thank you, Mr. Friday. Uh, it has been such a joy uh, sitting here listening to uh, the meeting. Uh, let me first of all thank um, Pastor Cooper and the Family Hang of the Free Law Society for organizing this. Let me thank all of you for attending. Uh, this is a very, very high moment, I think, at Jackson State. Um, these are the kinds of, 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 of activities that go on across this country at learning universities. And I want to thank you, Jack State, for learning university. Um, and so this is, is, is a very high moment. And I hope that when we all leave here, that we will reflect back on, uh, on the things that we have to say. Let me also say that um, it is still near an absurdity in Mississippi for a judge called me to, to exist. He gave you some of those uh, numbers. Black folk represent roughly a million people in this state, and those numbers, when we begin to disaggregate them and, and proportion them out, uh, it's still, I think, a near absurdity. Yeah, that God, that alone, a federal judge. So, you know, we know that there's a lot of work to do, and judge, we lay the, the context for that in terms of what we have to do, not just to use this vote, to have this vote, but also to use it in very strategic ways. And that is, is one of the things that I have, have thought about and talked about and written about over my uh, career. Um, I, I oftentimes, for example, think about uh, uh, Ralph Bunch. Uh, Ralph Bunch was the first black person to receive a PhD in, in political science. Um, and he, he had this, this uh, statement uh, that went like this. If the vote was nothing but fetch, and then the vast majority of white people would indeed have it. And of course, that was at a, a time when the vast majority of white people did not vote. And if you know anything about the, the uh, Black Belt South, then you know that the Black Belt South was held together because uh, the mass of black people were, were kept from voting as well as the mass of the poor whites. Uh, so we have here in, in uh, Judge Lee uh, a person who indeed represent uh, a, a very long way we have come, uh, but also a very long way that we have to Go and the vote is very, very important for that. I also want to note, and I'm sure Judge Reed would, would agree with this, uh, I love his, his passion. Um, and Judge Reed represents the opposite of what the stereotypical judge uh, is. And the stereotypical judge is quite painful. And we know <laughs> from Judge Reed's presentation here that he's not the, the stereotypical judge. Uh, and that's very important. <laughs> one, other, one, one other point I, I, I want to make is that his uh, uh, remarks in that, in that courtroom went, went viral because it points out that people in this country are very hungry for learned people to stand up and be learned in their passion. And if you read that, that statement, it is indeed a history lesson. And I, I would urge everybody to, in fact, get a copy of that, to, in fact, read that, that statement. One final comment be before I actually give them this, this gift. Um, in some ways, I intuitively have always known George Reed long before I met him. Um, his best friend from law school was one of my best students at South Carolina State. And I don't, I don't know whether uh, he ever regaled him with the sorts of stories uh, uh, from, from South Carolina State, uh, how he beat up these, these students, because we wanted them to be the best. Uh, one of the stories, this, this uh, student, his name is, is, is uh, Lynn Walkers, came back on, on a visit to tell me that when he got to UVA and some of his white classmates uh, found out that he knew logic, he said they couldn't believe that he knew logic and he wanted to know where he had learned logic and he told them, South Carolina State University. He said, no, 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 they don't teach logic at black school. Um, and I've had a number of students uh, during that, that period of time who I taught logic to, who came back and told me, if I had not taken your class in logic, it would have been equally, uh, very difficult for me in law school. Now, Judge Reed has told me many times that he has been he has taught on a regular basis, almost a daily basis, at least a weekly basis, and so forth. So in, in an intuitive way, I want to believe uh, that while I don't uh, make lawyers, I make them better, I want to believe that intuitively, <laughs> I have, have, have <laughs> So, just, just read the, the uh, Federal Game Honor Society has, has, has given you the gift 
I'm not sure what it is. You can open it now if you want. But it is my pleasure that they would ask me to hand this to you. Uh, and I want to say once again, we are quite proud of you here at Jackson State. And in the political science department, especially. So thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you, Judge.